What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Wrestling Heroes and Insiders podcast, a.k.a. The Whip Show. We're back. You know who it is. I am Deshaun Whip Dog Whipple, and I am here with my tag team partner and my historian, Devastating. Daryl hey, Pace, what's going on, man? Once again, Devastating Daryl Pace, man. Excited for today, today's show. You know, I, I am... You know, a big fan of 80s wrestling, you know, 70s wrestling. You know, I started watching wrestling early 80s, but I, you know, I venture back into the 70s, man. So I'm excited uh, very much so for today's show. Now, Daryl, I always say you're our Conrad Thompson. You're our historian. But I'm going to tell you, we got two gentlemen on the show today that might know a little bit more than you. Hey, bring it on. Can we please introduce to the show First off, Mr. Nikita Bresnikov. How are you doing today, sir? Hello, guys. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Thank you for being a part of the show. And we have Mr. Steve Goldstein. Now, Steve, I know you're feeling real good right now about certain events that have occurred today um, that's been on the news. But I need, I need a little break from it to Sean and Daryl, but I'm glad to be on the show. Take a little break. Appreciate it, guys. My God, my God. Well, first off, guys, once again, thank you for being a part of the show. I've seen so much about you. I've seen your Facebook post, and you guys have been very, very adamant about the wrestling world. Um, Nikita, I want to start off with you. Kind of yes. let people know what's your connection to wrestling, how far you go back, and what brought you to the wrestling, being a wrestling fan? Well, for me, to go back legitimately would be 1970 as a fan. I was still a kid, believe it or not. So, hey, to me, it saved my life. I was an abused child. My father was alcoholic, so it was terrible. But what did I have? The television. There they were. Chief J. Strongbow, Bruno San Martino, and the heels. We could have no wrestling without the heels. You had George Steele, Professor Tanaka, the whole group. So from that, the love of wrestling just led me to become a tape collector. Then when I got to meet Nikolai Volkov, because he was doing a local show, I was with the police department. So I saw the advertisement in the 7-Eleven, Nikolai Volkov going to be there. So I'm like, oh, beautiful. Uh, see if maybe I could get the line on some tapes. And I'm talking tapes back in the, at this time was 94, 1994. So there was no DVD, only VHS tapes. Oh my God. It was beautiful. For us, because that was new technology, but of course, DVD is much better. So, you know, I, I meet him and he's like, oh, no, I don't have nothing. But please, I, I pay you. I would love to have. I said, you ain't paying me nothing. I owe this to you. So I make him tapes. We become friends. And then naturally, you're going to bug him to death to get into the damn business. Who wouldn't? Right. And the rest is history. So then I got to manage him all those years. I heard she, Ivan Koloff, and just work with the great Bruno San Martino, Killer Kowalski, people like that. I luckiest son of a bitch on the face of the earth, I tell you guys, without a doubt. Man, that's a, that's amazing. You literally have had your hands in the business of some the greatest legends that we've had in the business, man. Yeah. I mean, it's like, oh man, I don't believe this. Some days you know, you hear the voice coming down the hallway and it's like, wow. I know that's Bruno. Oh wow, I don't believe it. And you stand there looking it's like uh, you know, yeah, yeah, you just, you, you know, you're so taken in by it. It's like, it's amazing. Nice, man. Well, Steve, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Deshaun. And Let I want to ask you the same question, man. What drew you to the love of pro wrestling? Well, I'll tell you, one of the th reasons, and Nikita and I are good friends. We met uh, online about, I don't know, about seven years ago. And uh, we do have a lot of similarities. We're both East Coast guys. He's uh, Baltimore. I'm Boston. And we grew up with the same wrestling on the East Coast, the WWF back in the day. And Nikita and I, are, we're exactly the same age, two months apart. I started watching a little earlier than Nikita. I can go back as far as like 1966. I was, you know, I was just a little kid. I turned on the TV. 
fell in love with wrestling. My parents thought it was crazy. They told me, don't put your sister in a headlock. You know, he's trying to copy the moves. But we grew up with the same, uh, the same wrestlers. Bruno was the champion, greatest wrestler in my lifetime. Victor Rivera, when Ivan Koloff beat Bruno. Um, yeah, I just, uh, there's a, because Nikita and I get a kick out of talking about it because this is our particular federation. And Nikita's got like an incredible memory. You can show him a picture and he can tell you the year and the arena that it took place in. I can't do that. My only thing is I go back a few years before him because I was a little younger, I guess, when I turned on the TV, Cowboy Bob Ellis, that kind of stuff. But um, anyways, I ended up going to film school, USC, got away from wrestling. I was a fan and uh, you know, I'm a screenwriter. And then back in 2013, uh, someone approached me and said, do you know who the Von Erichs are? And I said, yeah, I know who the Von Erichs are. And can you write a script? I said, yeah, sure, I can write a script. And that was back seven years ago, wrote a script, had a partner on the film, Lisa Renee Andrews. She passed away. That's a strange story in itself. But the film was going to be like a $20, $25 million uh, feature film production. And when she died, everything fell apart. I have an entertainment attorney in L.A. who has the story. We'd still like to get it made. But it drew me back into the business. I found out there were a lot of wrestlers on Facebook once you figure out who the real ones are from the posers. And all of a sudden, I'm friends with like guys I used to watch on TV when I was a little kid. In fact, I ended up living in Tulsa when I left L.A. I was on my way to Boston. I ended up in Tulsa for 20 months with Steve Cox, who I used to watch on television with the Von Erichs and then the UWF, Bill Watts. And, you know, one day I'm doing my laundry at Steve's house, and I said, it's so weird, man. I'm doing laundry with a guy I used to watch on television years ago, you know, wrestling. And, uh, you know, since then, wrestlers come to me with projects for writing. You know, every wrestler thinks they have a great story. They don't. Uh, but they think they do. Some do. The Von Erichs is a great story. I hope to get made. Uh, the Chris Benoit story is a great story great story but nobody really wants to touch that one um but you know you meet a lot of them on facebook and they do have different politics than i do for the most part but we reach an understanding it's it's business i bring something to the table i'm not one of the boys in the ring nikita took bumps i didn't take bumps in the ring um you know i'm 5'11, 160 i could be a manager that's it um but most of them are nice guys and uh you know there's a lot of sadness in the business it's like the music industry. A lot of them die young for various reasons. And those that survive, you know, and get to talk about it in their 50s and on, you know, it's kind of a brotherhood. So I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I've, I have a little niche. One time I said to Steve Cox, he said, if you're not one of the boys, you're a mark. You know, mark's not a good word. And I said, what am I? And Steve said, well, you're not a, one of the boys and you're not a mark. You kind of get your own little, uh, you know, niche you know, carved out for yourself here. And I said, that's great. I like to tell their stories uh, if it's a good story. And Nikita and I, you know, we've been friends for a while on here. We still need to meet face to face, brother. And we will. And, uh, you know, it's you meet some nice people in the business. It's all entertainment at the end of the day. I come from Hollywood wrestling. It's entertainment. It's you know, I consider wrestling unusual because it's it's half sport, half theater. It's uh, it's not, you know, it's a unique hybrid. And, uh, you know, I get a kick out of it. I used to teach a uh, high school English class, and uh, that's all my students wanted to talk about was wrestling. You know, uh, of course, some of them believe you could hit somebody over the head 20 times with a steel chair and not, and they pop up and it's all real. I said, no, nah, that's, that's not real. But, you know, it's kayfabe. <laughs> and that's about it. That's how I am where I am today. You know, I, I got a great, you know, question, right? You know, when I watch, when my son watches wrestling, he sees modern wrestling, and, I, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's hard for me to watch sometimes. You know, we've got the WWE Network, we've got tapes, we've got everything. He watches stuff from the '80s. He'll see Andre the Giant, it's like, oh my god, you know, he see Hulk, those Hulk Hogan matches, and even for his, for him now, that'll pop him, you know. Uh, but what was it like, you know? And, and, and again, I grew up in that '80s age. But then when I go, when I went back. I saw some of Bruno San Martino's matches. Again, I'm looking at it a different eye. When I was a little kid, I was like, "This stuff is boring. It's slow." Now coming back, looking at this stuff as an adult, you're like, "Man, look at the, you know, the chemistry, the way that these guys are working." Yeah. What was it like, you know, in the late '60s, early '70s? You know, tell us, you know, today, what's it like, you know, when Bruno San Martino reigned? What, what, what were the matches like? What was the excitement like for being a fan? Want to go? Do you take it, Nikita? You got to understand the era. Now, I always say all sports, the 70s was the greatest sports era. 
it was evolving. It was a little bit rogue and it was, a, it wasn't like over the top, but they were starting to like baseball games. You know, sometimes they could be long and boring, but they were, if you understood baseball, it's never boring. There's so much going on. You can't keep up with it. Actually, each the battle between the pitcher and the catcher. So we had the Orioles, the Mets of the seventies, the Cincinnati Reds, the Boston Red Sox. With yeah, the Red Sox. I mean, my God, with football, the Miami Dolphins, boxing, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman or Joe Frazier, the world stop today. I don't know who the hell's boxing champion is. Nobody cares. You yeah. know, even Sugar Ray Leonard. It's like, man, that was big news. Yeah. Ice hockey was doing great. And even the roller derby, you know, I'm like, man, oh man, that's, um, you know, those were just great times. But when you had wrestling, when Bruno, you can't duplicate, you can't make somebody love you. You can't make somebody hate you if you're the heel. He spoke to the audience and he didn't go crazy. He, you never heard Bruno scream and holler or, or get oh. real, real aggressive. He would just come out and say, I'm going to do my best, and you better do your best too, Zabisco, or you better do your best, Arion, because I'm going to do everything I can. And we connected with that. And when that man walked down the aisle with no music, nothing, no smoke, no nothing, just him, and the building just erupted. Strongbow, another one, Chief J. Strongbow, when he came out with the headdress and the bells, it's like, man, we're all, it's Christmas every month. And you got to remember, in those days, Black Friday, like the for the businesses, was Madison Square Garden plus those arenas. If you didn't sell out, hey, there was not going to be any company there. You know, it was going to fold. Television was just the advertisement. It was like an infomercial, one hour, okay? And then you had some promos in between to, to get you to come out. But the money was made in the arenas. Today, it's all made with the pay-per-view, the arenas. They still have house shows a little bit here and there, but ah, it's not like it used to be that way. And I don't knock anybody. God bless them. The men and women, they risk their lives every day, every time they step in the ring. But it is what it is. You know, you got to follow what the boss says. So, so today it's Cartoon Central and that's it. Well, Nikita and I, we, we remember exactly when wrestling changed. 1984, rock and wrestling connection when Hulk Hogan beat the Iron Sheik. That changed it completely. It now, and I don't mind the new era, although it's not as interesting in a lot of ways, because like Nikita says, it's cartoonish. They gear it more towards your son, Daryl. You know, I don't know if your son's 12, but that's kind of where they gear it. But it, uh, what I miss most about that, because uh, I'm not one of these old timers who says wrestling was good in my day, it sucks today. There's a lot of amazing athletes today. Uh, they're not as good on the mic. You don't See, what was really good when Nikita and I were growing up was what I call the switch. When a good, when a face became a heel in the middle of a match or an interview or a heel became a face, they ch changed. Nowadays, you get a guy like CM Punk who switched from face to heel like 38 times and nobody cares because you're not emotionally invested in it. I asked my friend Steve Cox once, why is that? He goes, these are like boy band wrestlers. They're not actors. He goes, we had guys who could act in our day. And that was part of the job being on the mic. Like a guy like Ric Flair, not a great wrestler, although probably the most successful one of all time because he's a great performer. I love when people on here do these imaginary matches between Bruno and Ric Flair, and they think Ric Flair wins. And right away, I know they grew up like watching WCW. Ric Flair, Bruno could beat Ric Flair with one hand tied behind his back for real. Bruno was the real deal. Ric Flair is the most successful wrestler of all time as a performer. Bruno was a legitimate strong man. I believe he held some, uh, Nikita can correct me, he held some world uh, powerlifting or uh, lifting records. He has a very interesting story. Now, as a writer, Bruno would make a great story because during World War II, he grew up in Abruzzo, Abruzzo, Italy. His mother hid him from the Nazis, and he made it to America. And he was a sickly child, I was just reading recently. I like Charles Atlas, people kicking, you know, 98-pound weakling, kicking dirt in his face, sand. But then he started weightlifting, and he turned into this incredible, incredibly strong. He's only about 5'10", right, Nikita? Is that yeah. all he was with 5'10"? Sure. Well, yeah, but he was just, he could, he could break you in half. 
and he had a nice persona. He, as Nikita said, he didn't get wild or crazy or foam at the mouth, but you knew what you were getting from Bruno. And those were in the days when you held the title for seven and a half years, which you don't see nowadays. And at the time, I mean, I remember when I was a kid and Ivan Koloff beat Bruno for the title. I was listening to it on the radio or something. It was kind of like Foreman Ali. I was shocked that Koloff took the title from Bruno because after seven and a seven years, seven and a half years, I mean, Koloff, you know, legitimately great wrestler, but you never thought Bruno was going to lose. And then, you know, then they went through the point where Pedro Morales beats Ivan and uh, superstar, you know, Bob Backlund. Bruno gets the title back for four years in the middle. But uh, yeah, that's the wrestling we grew up on. I didn't know about NW. WA and AWA and world class championship wrestling with the Von Erics until later on, until you bought wrestling magazines. Then you found out it was a whole world out there you know, of different federations. And once cable came along, you got to watch everything on TV. I re the worst thing Vince McMahon has done, and I don't fault him, I mean, he's, he's, he's not a good human being. I've had some dealings with him on the Von Erich script, but he made wrestling mainstream. And, but he destroyed all the territories. It used to be Saturday morning in the 80s. I could get up, flip around. I'd find continental wrestling from Memphis with Jerry Lawler. Uh, you'd find stuff you never even knew existed before. Uh, that's why I kind of like AEW. It reminds me of the old WCW. Uh, I don't know. You know, uh, you know, the writing, uh, the worst part of the WWE is the writing. I don't understand why they don't do better storylines, uh, tell a better story that drags on over the weeks. You know, but I look at it from a writer's perspective sometimes. That was fun when Nikita and I were kids. When, when Jimmy Valiant turned on Chief J. Strongbow Nikita, was that uh, how it worked? In, uh, yeah. That's 1971. Just, uh, that was the first guy to turn on Strongbow. Yeah. He wanted to learn to sleeper. So yeah. that's when he yeah. went with Beautiful Bobby and the Grand Wizard. Yeah. And that was okay. That didn't go crazy with that feud. It was the Spiro Sarian turn on Strongbow and Bruno that set – it was like – it was death to try yeah. to get in and out of the arena for Spiro Sarian. We were just we were shocked like, as fans. We couldn't believe we, it. We, you bastard. You did it to yeah. both of them at the yeah. same time on television. I was like, oh, my God. And I tell you, it was gold. The WWF, yeah. WWF, they struck gold with that. Because Evan Ginsberg, uh, associate producer of The Wrestler and the movie 350 Days on the Road, good, dear friend for 30 years, his father was a cab driver. He said the first time Bruno wrestled Arion in the garden, February 17th of 1975, they all parked their cabs. Everybody was going in. The Italian and the Greek cab drivers, all the, they were there. They, it was like, it meant something. Yeah. Yeah, people always told us it was this, it was that, you know, it's like, so what? We can suspend yeah. our disbelief. We can enjoy it. Like you go to a, a movie. Play in the they, theater, you know? But, you didn't have people trying to like the dead man walking with the undertaker and stuff like that. It's yeah. like, oh, come on, this is a bit too much. Yeah. God bless him. Great guy, great athlete. But it's like, no, well, they didn't you, have that then. Now, K Fabe died when they found the Iron Sheik and Hex saw Jim Duggan smoking pot in the car and they were hanging out together. All of a sudden, what? They weren't mortal enemies. I'm glad you guys, that's actually where I wanted to go next, man. I'm glad you okay. brought up about K Fabe dying. Um, obviously, once they start calling it sports entertainment, that was the official quote unquote. Yeah. But back then, a, a bigger percentage of the world thought wrestling was still a shoot. Yeah. So when it transitioned, do you think that hurt the business as a fan? Did it hurt it to you being a part of the business? Did it hurt it? Or do you think it had to be done? What do you think? Well, I know Vince McMahon was glad that it was done because at that point, now you take the state athletic commissions and say, hey, you don't have a place here anymore. You don't get to pick my pocket. You don't get to pick the boys' pockets because everybody had to have a license, believe it or not, you know, yeah. and you have to have a physical before you go out through that curtain. And it's like, oh man, and everything costs money. It always costed money. And they take a percentage of the gate. So then it was like, Vince was pissed to a point. It's like, okay, I don't care that you two were smoking marijuana and got locked up. That's, you know, that's your problem. But you killed us. You killed the business because now here you two are in a hot feud and people are saying, what the hell are they doing in a car together? But then the <laughs> light bulbs are going off. Hey, now I can do this with the state athletic commission out of my hair once and for all. So I think he liked it. 
Did it kill the business? Sure. Yeah. It, it exposed it without a doubt. But, you know, I think with the Hulk Hogan, when he became the cartoon Hulk Hogan, because he was really good in his first run of 79, 80, and 81. He wasn't vocal like he was before he went to do the Rocky II movie, but he was quite an athlete because he's had some good matches with Backlund. Yeah. Yeah, really did. They were no classics, but they were pretty damn good for what Hogan could give. But, you know, when Vince decided, when he took the business from his dad who was dying with the cancer and he started to invade everybody and take the talent, then it was... And, because you never saw Nikolai Volkov wear red before. He was all black. Okay, They said Siberia. First, he was the Mongol. Then he was from Siberia. He had black trunks and the, you know just a black shirt he would come out in. Then they do the whole Soviet thing. Now he's wearing the red and he's got the Soviet flag. Okay, all cartoon stuff. Because the Sheik, the same thing. You didn't need that when he was the great Hussein of Iraq from Iran in 1979. Because they had enough natural heat, but to cartoon it, yeah, then he's doing the clubs, and but that was legitimate, that was no bullshit. And I mean, he was something. the real deal, the Sheik. Yeah. Nobody, there, there was nobody that could do those clubs, and not the amount of time that he could. There was all kind of strong guys that came in there, only she could do it. It was the wrist strength that was just incredible. Because he said, We train. From like eight years old, we would do this stuff. Not that heavy, of course, but they would start getting prepared for it. And it was like, man, that's, he was an incredible athlete. I have lots of respect for him. You know, there, there's so much stuff I want to ask you guys. I, I got to do a sidetrack because you brought okay. You know, with Nikolai, and I know you spent a lot of time with Nikolai Volkov, how well did him and the Sheik actually get along? Did they get along well? I mean, what was it like hanging out? And, and we know the Sheik, right? So yeah, what was it like hanging out they with loved you? each other. No question. They That's loved right. each other. And, but they were like a married couple. They fight all the time. Believe me. <laughs> but not, not physical. Well, you know, argue this, argue that. But they loved each other until the final day, without a doubt. And I tell you, there's. I hate to talk about Sheik because people make a fool of him because he's one of the greatest athletes we've ever experienced. I'm talking about all of us right here, but everybody that watched him, that guy trained. Now he would do some bad stuff. I'm not going to say what it is, but we all have a good idea, but yet he would go work out after he would do that stuff too. Nobody worked out harder than the man. And I'll tell you what, I know he's in a wheelchair today. I still wouldn't fight him. And it's like, no, no, thank you. This guy knows his stuff and he, he he's trained for it because he was the show of Iran's bodyguard. That's legitimate. Because when his mom died, he said, oh, look, he died when I go back home. My mother, but they would kill me. I said, Sheik, they, you're lucky they don't come here for you. Yeah, I don't go home, please. I mean, <laughs> if mom's gone, I know it's hard, but what are you going to do anyway? You know, cry here. Just let it go, man. Or are you going to join her? My favorite Iron Sheik story I heard, uh, he was in the locker room for after a match, and Bruno was there, and Bruno was already in his 60s by this point, and six NFL players walked into the locker room who had been at the show, and they thought they could mess with the Iron Sheik and a 60-year-old Bruno. Long story short, yeah, they got hurt, those six NFL players, when they left. They, Bruno and the Iron Sheik tried, turned them into knots, tied them. Well, it was Pittsburgh. And yeah. it was four of the Steelers, and they came backstage, and Bruno was like, come on, guys, you know, because Bruno was the eight road agent. So, you know, he's in charge of the locker room. He's like, come on, you guys, we, we can't come back in your locker room. You're not supposed to be back here. They said, hey, look at this old guy, old timer. Hey, you know, so they start shoving him around. Bruno's trying to hold his own, but it's just not going to happen with these young NFL players. So somebody hollers, Bruno's getting beat up by football players. Sheik comes out of the shower. He's still wet, naked, still got so he starts suplexing him. Boom, 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 boom. boom. It's like, oh man, let me tell you something. That's you a get him guy. fired up and you better run for cover. That's all I can yeah. say. He he's like, if you ever saw that movie uh True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger and his wife drops that Uzi and it's going down the steps, firing and taking the S sheet. It, when he's on fire, he's just like an automatic weapon. He's just gonna wipe everything out. That's it. Yeah. Run. Amazing athlete. His hot tag was a shoot, you dig? <laughs> yeah. Now, oh, Steve, boy. I want to touch base a little bit on the Von Erics with you, man. Okay. One of the greatest wrestling families ever. Obviously, a lot of tragedy has hit them. Yeah. What 
initially drew you to the Von Ayers? Was it Fritz? Was it just watching all world class um, championship wrestling? What made you like them? And how do you feel about how the way the family? Well, I'll tell you, I uh, didn't know about the Von Erichs other than the wrestling magazines, but in the 1980s, they got a syndicated ESPN contract. And once they went syndicated, Fritz, the uh, dad, he was going to make the big three a big four. You know, it was uh, WWF, NWA, AWA, and World Class Championship Wrestling, WCCW, that was going to join them. And then also in 1984, which is when Rock and Wrestling Connection started, that's when the dominoes started to fall the bad way for the Von Erichs. David Von Erich, who was, uh, you know, six foot seven, red-headed guy, he took after Fritz. Uh, he had a head for the business. He used to book like Fritz did. He was going, but they were grooming him to be the world heavyweight champion NWA from Ric Flair. He was trading the Missouri State title back and forth with uh, Harley Race. And he was, they were grooming him to take it from Rick. He was younger, and uh, he, he checked all the boxes. Great skills, six, seven. And then he went to Japan on a tour, and he died. And, you know, they say a parasitic infection. I've heard other things as well. Could be drugs. Bru uh, Bruiser Brody carried him out uh, at the time. It's, uh, that was the beginning of the end. But they kept on the Von Erichs because Kerry got the title. Uh, but he, he beat Ric Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight title, only held it for three weeks. Problem with Kerry was, and I got to know Kevin pretty well when I got to work on the project. I'll tell you how I met him. Kerry was like, he gave you the shirt off his back, but he probably wasn't the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. And uh, he was more interested in like the flashier side of life. And one thing I asked Kevin, uh, did you ever want to be World Heavyweight Champion? Because, you know, Kevin won a lot of heavyweight titles, too, and they were the big three. And Kevin said, you know, Steve, to be the champion, you got to be able to wrestle six, seven nights a week. You don't get to go home to your wife and kids at night, and you have to be reliable. you got to show up. And he goes, "I mar he married his high school sweetheart, Kevin. He goes, Kerry, the reason Kerry only held it for three weeks, he had the physique, he had the skills, he had the look. But he wasn't reliable, Kerry. So he had some drug issues, too. Um, you know, so he took it away. Anyways, back in 2013, a woman on Facebook, and Facebook's a double-edged sword. You make some interesting contacts. Uh, look at us sitting there. But you meet some wackos, too, right? And some of them are in wrestling, you know, fanboys who live in their mother's basement. Uh, you got to avoid those people. So anyway, she found me on Facebook. She thought I was another Steve Goldstein because Steve Goldstein is like the Jewish John Smith. There's a lot of us with that name, Steve Goldstein. So I said, no, I'm not that Steve Goldstein. Well, you're a writer. I said, yeah, I'm a writer. You, you know wrestling. Yeah, I know wrestling. So she goes, I grew up in Dallas. Her name was Lisa. And she was, in, she was a publicist, had a music background. And uh, she said, I'm going to get a hold of Kevin and we're going to make a film, you know, make a movie. She goes, would you like to do a documentary? And I said, no. I said, they've already done two documentaries on the Von Erichs. They were well-received. Let's do a feature because that story is Shakespearean. It's like they had it all. They lost it all. The Von Erichs in Texas are like the Kennedys in Massachusetts. That might be my phone. Hold on. I'm just going to turn it off. Yeah, don't worry about it. Hold on. Excuse me, guys. No problem. Let's see. Okay. So anyways, uh, I said, let's do a feature because... You had six brothers and a father who was a heavyweight champion as well. And five of the brothers died. And the first one, Jack Jr., Fritz von Erich's real name was Jack Adkinson. Uh, the oldest one, Jack Jr., died at six years old. They were living in a trailer park. Fritz was working for Stu Hart in those days up in Canada. And he got electrocuted, Jack Jr. So if you believe in a curse, that's when the curse started. And then, uh, you know, over the course of uh, the next decades uh three four brothers died three by suicide in a six-year period so as a writer it's a, you know you hate to say it's a hell of a story because people died it's tragic but you know from a writer's perspective it's really a great story and uh you know first david died then uh mike von eric got toxic shock syndrome on a trip in israel and that's unusual for a guy to get toxic shock syndrome but it happens uh, somehow through an infection. He ended up committing suicide too. I actually know the doctor who treated him and the doctor's wife. Uh, 
And then, you know, Carrie, I happen to be uh, 93. I flew to Boston from LA to attend my father's funeral. And I had a stopover in Dallas. I took a Delta flight. They had a bereavement fair. And I stopped in Dallas, first time south of the Mason-Dixon line. And I said, wow, here I am in, you know, Texas. And I went into the convenience, you know, the store right in the airport. And on the front page of the Dallas Herald, Carrie Von Erich commits suicide. It was like front page news. And it was just weird. I happened to be in Texas at that time. And this was well before I was involved in the film. That was like 20 years before. And, uh, you know, he committed suicide. And then a couple of years later, uh, the youngest one, Chris, who was kind of the runt of the family, he was only 5'7", and he didn't have the muscles the other brothers did, but he just wanted to be a wrestler. And they were a very religious family, Devon Eriks. They thought that if they killed themselves, because I've heard stories from Bret Hart and Ric Flair, that they would see their, you know, dead brothers on the other side. You know, that'd be nice if that's true, but I'm not willing to take the chance when I'm in my 20s or 30s to do something like that. But, you know, three suicides in six years. Kevin's okay. He's uh, in Hawaii. He's the last surviving brother. Married his high school sweetheart, Pam. Uh his uh, his two sons, Ross, Ross and Marshall, are in the business. They they had a tryout with WWE NXT, but they didn't make it. Uh, but they're they're winning some titles around there. And uh, I said to Kevin one time, we used to, when we were trying to get the film going, uh, do you worry about your sons being in the business? Like if the walls ever start, you know, closing in. And he said, you know, Kerry called me just before he killed himself, and he said he was despondent that his uh, wife was leaving him. He was going to go to prison for a couple of years for steroid distro painkiller distribution. And he goes, maybe I should have been there. So he goes, my sons know that they call me if anything goes on. Uh, he goes, but we're good. And anyways, I had a partner on the film and I wrote the story. And uh, then Lisa, you know, the problem is we were doing all this communicating on Facebook and through our, through my friend, Steve Cox, I had set up the, uh, the financing through some uh, big oil, oil multimillionaire wrestling fans in Oklahoma who love wrestling. And uh, we were all set to go. And then Lisa mysteriously disappeared uh, right before New Year's Eve, like around December 7th, uh, three weeks before. And she ended up murdered. And there's, you know, that, and people start talking about the Von Eric curse again. It, Steve Cox and I talked about that a lot. Uh, we never met, but we were doing business together. And we think maybe she got mixed up in some, over a money situation with drugs, cartel or something. And uh, the film... You know, everybody just pulled back because that's what murder does. And my attorney, entertainment attorney, has the script still. It's mine. And, you know, hopefully we'll get it made one day. I, I'll need to talk to Kevin again. We can do it without Kevin's permission. Uh, but, you know, Kevin's kind of, uh, he's kind of bitter and he's paranoid the way his life turned out. I mean, not that he has good stuff, but he doesn't trust people very easily. And, you know, and, and fans are funny. I was running a page on Facebook when we had the film uh, going to go into production had 52,000 people. And all they wanted to do was talk about the dead Von Erics, you know, like, and they'd say, rest in peace, Kevin. I say, Kevin's fine. Kevin's alive. He's living in Hawaii with his family. His kids stop burying the poor man. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of Von Erics who wrestled for WCCW, who weren't members of the family, I call them the non erics they also met tragic ends. Bruiser Brody was stabbed to death in Carlos Colon's promotion down in Puerto Rico. Chris Von Erich was killed killed in a uh, barroom brawl, shot to death by a friend. Gino Hernandez did a cocaine overdose. Um, you know, it's a very tragic, and they were all in the script, you know, some of them in minor parts. It's a story that deserves to be told and I hope it gets done, but I got to navigate with Kevin, the fans I don't care about because, you know, they're kind of like morbid deadheads. They just, you know, let the bed, they live in the 1980s, you know, and I'm just saying, yeah, they don't talk about anything else except old matches. Uh, I was showing, I was running the page. I was showing old matches Saturday night and it was great. They said, I used to watch this with my grandmother with the cane and my grandfather. And, um, but yeah, I mean, like Nikita, you know, we don't live in the 1980s anymore and uh, wrestling's moved on and the story can be told and it can be a Hollywood feature and we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And you got a couple of spinoffs because you had Waldo Von Erich, the brother, oh, Waldo Von Erich, who goes right. in his own direction and conquers the East Coast. The guy Bruno wrestled the most out of anybody else. And you got King Kong Bundy, who came out of the Von Erichs clan in Texas. He was Big Daddy Bundy, if I remember. And Cactus Jack Manson also, when he was 
uh, I think casting cactus. I think uh, Fritz gave him the name Cactus Jack Manson, you know, because he looked like Charlie Manson. And then that that went away real early because Manson is not a good uh, gimmick to run with. But uh, yeah, Big Daddy Bundy. Sure. I remember that. Uh, yeah, no, they, they, he started friends, the you know, WWF in 1981 yeah. as Chris Canyon and then as Chris Cannon. They couldn't figure out which name to go with. But he was big because he had that yeah. purple outfit on. Right. And then, you know, OK, he was nothing more than jobber there. And then he goes down south, hooks up with Fritz and boom. Next thing you know, you got King Kong Bundy and is like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and he conquered a world. Fritz von Erich was ahead of his time. World Class Championship Wrestling was the first wrestling organization to do the music, you know, and the lights there. And, uh, you know, so they were revolutionary. And once they got that ESPN contract, they were looking to go national. But then people started dying, starting with David. David would have been, yeah, he would have been like, you know, he was going to be legendary. He just had the size, the skills. He liked to book. He had a head for the business. Uh, you know, he was kind of, uh, he was kind of uh, Fritz's favorite, I think, in a lot of ways. But, you know, then he died and other people died. And now it's just like sad memories. I think it's one of those things where back in those days, because you think about Magnum TA was another one where we had these guys that are groomed to be this, this, this guy. Yeah. And then something happened. Car but I, I want to. I want to take it back a little bit, right? Because, you know, when you think about the 80s, we had the big muscle-up guys, right? When you think about the 70s, we had legitimate shooter, tough guys. Oh, I mean, yeah. We got guys that had carried guns. We got guys that drive fast cars. I mean, what was it? I mean, I don't, I, you know, what was it like, you know, and, and maybe some of you met some of these guys later, but what is it like? It just, it just, it's hard for me to imagine walking into an office or walking into a business working with the most extreme maniacs of all time. Like, what was it like, you know, working with or being around some of these guys? They were real people. They they were never, I'm better than you. I've sold out the guard. I've done that. I never got that from anybody. I remember the first time I met George the Animal Steel, and it was like, oh, my God, how many times have I imitated George Steel, you know, with the hey and the you and stuff like that? Not the cartoon version, but the guy that when he looked in the direction, he would empty out a whole section. People would climb over each other's back and get the hell out of the way. The animal. But yeah, because he's coming. Because one night, Mrs. Krieger, who was a mainstay in Baltimore, Washington, and <laughs> Madison Square Garden, she would be at every show. She took her shoe off one night, got behind him, was slapping him in the back of the head. He turned around. Whew, he took the shoe and he rips it up with his teeth and throws it in the air. And then he looks around at the rest of us, and we scatter. I mean, we're out of there, man. There ain't no way. You look at this crazy son of a bitch. Run! Here he comes. So when you actually talk to him, and you know, he was a football coach and a, a, a physical education coach in mm -hmm. Madison, uh, Michigan, because they actually named the stadium after him for the <laughs> high school, Jim Meyer Stadium. And it's like, wow. It, you know, that touches you. Somebody like that who really cared, because he never would admit to it, because he's like, oh, you act like Tony Steele. That ain't me. And it's like, yeah, the students would say, that's you, Mr. Myers. Look at that picture. <laughs> no, he wouldn't admit it. Not not for 10 seconds. Yeah, but, well, know, man. See, for me, world, like. It's a small world, because I was staying with it, because I do acting, too. So I'm staying with a, a film uh, director and producer, and he's up there in Madison, right? So I'm looking at this school at the end of the block and it was on Lawrence Avenue. So I'm thinking, gee, that can't be the same place because I thought it was East Madison, but I was wrong. It was just Madison that he was from. So I called Johnny Valiant. I said, uh, cause it was good friends. God rest his soul. I said, John, where did George T? He said, Madison. He said, you're right down the street. So when I got back home, I call him. I said, Jim, were you, uh, I was on uh, Lawrence Avenue. He said, I used to live on Lawrence with 100 block. And, I, and he says, that's one block away. I'm like, man, what a small world. Too too crazy, you know? It was just wild. But to meet them, the, after looking at them on television, it's like, wow. Yeah. It, it's unbelievable. Surreal. Just absolutely surreal. Now, when you mentioned shooters, uh, Daryl, uh, you know, I used to watch guys like, Jack Briscoe, who was a legitimate shooter in the NWA, two-time champion. And, uh, you know, he had a mean streak, too. Guy like Jack, you would watch him in the ring. And, you know, he was an amateur state champion in Oklahoma. Uh, another guy like that was Chavo Guerrero, who one of my greatest moments was 
being told to call Chavo and getting yelled at on the phone. Who gave you my number? Who gave you my number? You know, and uh, they both passed on. But these guys were the kind of guys who could do chain wrestling. And the other boys in the locker room, they would come out and watch Chavo Guerrero's match or a Jack Briscoe match because there was an art to the wrestling. Even today, you can see some of these guys really know how to wrestle and some of these guys are performing. Um, but you yeah, back in the day, you saw guys like Briscoe, Chavo Guerrero, Bob Backlund, Nikita. These guys were legitimate wrestlers. I mean, they could uh, they could hurt you if they wanted to, you know. And, uh, you know, we all know the uh, Ric Flair, Bob Backlund story there. But, you know, Ric Flair was scared to death that Bob could really hurt him. Uh, you know, Rick. You, you know, Rick is successful, probably more so than anyone. But, yeah, Bob was legit. Guy like Briscoe, if he didn't like you in the locker room, he would take it out in the ring on you. You couldn't stop him sometimes. You know, some guys he can't control, like Bruiser Brody. Everybody, everybody from the bottom of the car to the top, like a Dominic DiNucci. Yeah. He was like an Iron Man. Like, he's yeah. made of iron. He didn't have bulky muscles, but he had those long, gangly arms. Like Killer yeah. Kowalski. Oh, Killer. If he wrapped around you. It's like they used to say, twisted steel. You ain't getting away from these yeah. octopus. That's it, man. He's going to crush the breath right out of you. It's unbelievable. And you can look at Kowalski. You see his hands all gnarled up, his ears, his nose. And it's like, oh, uh, and Bruno, too. It's like, you know what? These guys, they gave of their body to, and they tried to take care of each other back then. Yeah. Not like today where they're actually killing each other and people still laugh and say, oh, look at that phony shit. And it's like, no, they're actually oh. beating each other's brains out. Yeah. They, they don't hurt. know how to work. You know, and even today I see guys like, because I watch wrestling today, I see a guy like Keith Lee. I love Keith Lee. I mean, here's a guy who's like 340 pounds. Uh, uh, you know, he's overweight, obviously, but he does moves in the ring that impress me. And they're giving him a nice push in the WWE. Um, you know, because back in the day, you saw a lot more out of shape wrestlers than, you know, uh, you would see a lot of, you know, Haystacks Calhoun. You never see a Haystacks Calhoun anymore. 600 yeah, but wait pounds. a minute, Steve. But, he, 600 pounds, legit. Walk to the ring. Yeah. Put the horseshoe on the ring, yeah. clothes, do his thing. He wasn't going to do cartwheels or anything, but he'd give you 10, 15 minutes, yeah. put the horseshoe on and walk back. Nobody yeah. had to help him. It's like, no, no, but impressive. after 15 minutes, it's he was gassed. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't use that. Yeah, yeah gorilla, 400, 400 pounds. pounds. He would do, to do the uh, leapfrogs and do all yeah. kind of like, man, oh man, this is incredible. Oh, yeah. so, some of these guys are amazing who don't look like bodybuilders uh you know it's uh, so i still watch wrestling today it's it's a different animal uh but yeah you like to see the independence and some other stuff uh yeah it's uh it's changed over the years but i'm yeah i'm glad i'm connected the nice thing about wrestling a guy like rick flair is still around that i used to watch growing up i mean guys managed to make money no matter where he is how old well, he's 71 years old now i think don't, he'll don't still take a bump also, every now and then. he's still doing it he just had his yeah. 50th anniversary yeah, yeah, no, he's just in his day. He's got his daughter in a nice place in the business, uh, but he's had tragedy. His son committed, uh, his son killed himself for a drug overdose. Uh, there's been a lot of tragedy in his life, too, but he God, perseveres. I can't let y'all get out of here without doing this. I want to bring in a surprise segment. Daryl okay. doesn't even know about this. We got three, as it could you, Daryl, historians in the building. So right now we're going to do something called the Whip Show game show. Uh -oh. I've got 10 yeah. questions. Some of them are going to be easy. Well, it should be easy for all of you guys. We're just going to throw some stuff out there. And I want you guys to keep a tally of how many correct points you get. Okay? Okay. We're going to start with Daryl, go to Steve and Nikita. We're going to go clockwise until the 10 questions are up. Okay? okay. Are you up? First of all, are you guys up for this? Yes. I'm, ready. I'm up for it. Let's go. And uh, when I edit this, I'll put some type of a uh, game show music uh, behind it as well. Don't worry. <laughs> now, number one, Daryl, since this is your house, the question is, who was the Black Scorpion in WCW? Once again, who was the Black Scorpion in WCW? In WCW? Well, it, it ended up being Ric Flair. It ended up being Ric Flair, right? Yes. Number two, we're going to go to Steve. The question is, what was Ultimate Warrior's name in USWA slash World Class Championship Wrestling. The Dingo Warrior. Absolutely, ding, ding, ding. Now Nikita, it's on you, brother. All right. And I know you you know this one, this is an easy one. Did NWA champion Ric Flair ever face Bob Backlund when he was the WWF champion? Oh yes, it was 4th of July, 
1981, I believe it was. Yes. Yeah, and it was down. It, it was uh, in St. Louis, or uh, no, no, not St. Louis, but uh, or yeah, it was St. Louis, wasn't it? Yes, and West, that okay. that was uh, no, it was Georgia at the Omni. I'm sorry, okay. Atlanta, Georgia at the Omni, and that's when it was a little hairy because Backlund, according to his book, he gets her and he's like, "Hey, this doesn't look right. Nobody's talking to me." He calls the old man and it's like. This looks spooky. I don't know. And they said, protect yourself, Bobby. He says, oh, yeah. That's when Steve said, you know, Flair said, don't hurt me, Bob. I ain't going to, don't hurt me, please. I said, I ain't going to hurt you, but you ain't going to take the belt from me tonight. So that was title versus title. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Do you remember the outcome of that match? Draw. 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 As the first intercontinental champion, Pat Patterson. Okay, Rio okay. de Janeiro. Did it? Did it really happen or no? No, it didn't happen. But but he's that's where he was recognized. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I always remember the T-shirt that he wore. But I, I gave you a little tidbit on that. They always say September the first, nineteen seventy nine. But yet, when he wrestled Backlund for the third time on August twenty seventh in the Garden. This was before the big cage match. They announced him as the newly crowned intercontinental champion. So it's like nobody knew where that came from. That was <laughs> wild. Do you hear this man? With, this man knows his dates off the top of his head. Oh, yeah, no. It's, it's like a photographic wrestling memory. Oh, my God. <laughs> we're going, Steve, we're going back to you. Number uh, five. Who was Hogan's manager in AWA? Oh, wait a second. Uh, ooh, uh, uh, I'm going with the uh, damn, I should know this one too. Uh, clock is ticking. AWA manager, I'm gonna say Blassie, Fred Blassie. No, correct, sir. I am, I got it. Okay, yes. I thought I didn't think we we're gonna get that one, man. <laughs> now, Nikita, Whoosh. another fastball down the lane for you it was Bobby Heenan ever a professional wrestler oh yes absolutely tell me a story of bobby heenan wrestling bobby heenan in indianapolis he was like i mean look when people talk about ecw was hardcore yeah okay but they didn't invent it bobby heenan was a bleeding son of a gun okay oh, yeah. he was you a could follow him around with a bag and fill it up and you could go take care of the blood bank no trouble just like the sheep herders the kiwi sheep herders when Forget the Bushwhackers. I love them to death. Great guys. But they made cartoons out of them. Yeah, Those right. guys in Puerto Rico, they would have barbed wire matches. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, man. Let me tell you, that was a real deal. So, yes, Bobby Heenan was a professional wrestler before he became a manager. And he was a big part of the Valiant Brothers and putting them together. Yeah. That's another long story. Woo. All right. Everybody got, everybody got all their points so far. Question number seven, Daryl goes to you. Excluding Hawk and Animal, name three members of the original Legion of Doom. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, we have Paul Ellering. Right. Right. Now, this was Jimmy Hart's. What, the Legion of Doom was it? Oh, wait, wait, wait. That was the first time. I can no, name no, no, one more. Wait, wait, wait. So we got Paul Ellering. Yeah. Did the dummy count? <laughs> You got five seconds, Daryl. Come on. Uh, well, Rick, well, no, wait. I'm thinking about. See, I'm thinking about Rude, but that was that was uh, the first time. I, I don't know. I don't know. Jake, I don't know. Jake no, no, the right. Snake Roberts. Jake yes, the Snake. Right? Goes to Steve Goldstein. Jack, now we need. You said Jake. He said. Uh, who else did you say? You said Paul. Like, <laughs> if you can steal the point, if you give me one more, Steve, one more. One more. Ah, oh, geez. Uh, well, you said Daryl said Rick Rude. He was part of the, uh, I know Jake the Snake. Jake, Rick Rude was not uh, part of it. And I can't name another one other than Ellering, the Warriors, and Jake the Snake. Well, Bundy? Was Bundy? Bundy? Maybe? The turn. Nikito's your turn. <laughs> I'm going to hit you with Kamala because I love the guy, but that's it. I'm... No, guys, actually, all of you didn't, nobody got the point for that one. The answers were, besides the Road Warriors, Hawking Animal, Jake the Snake Roberts, the spoiler, Matt Moore, King Kong Bundy. Oh, you got it. King Kong Bundy was in it. That's right. The okay. sheep was in it. 
The sheep. The sheep? Wow. What? Yeah. Oh, the original sheep. Okay. I. Yep. I was right, getting it mixed up with Jimmy Hart's that first family one. too. I was getting it off, so I wasn't sure. Yeah. See? So I stumped y'all at least one time. Daryl, we're going back to you. Number eight. Before becoming a wrestler, what team did Fritz von Erich play professional football for? Oh, you're going to skip me on that one. <laughs> Here's Steve, Steve. we're going up to your wheelhouse here, Steve. Oh, Once again. You know, uh, I'm, I know he played, I'm thinking he played in the CFL. Um, no, then I'm just uh, Calgary Stampeders, but I'm guessing now. Nope, no? nope. Nikita, do you have an answer? I'm saying Atlanta Falcons rings for whatever reason. Unfortunately, no. The answer was the Dallas Texans. Uh, Texans before they became the Cowboys. Wow. Yes. Yeah. All right, so we those two stumped you guys. Going to number nine. Here, we're back to you. WCW slash NWA had a 1980 sitcom that featured many pro wrestling stars. Who was the star of the show? Gosh, was that the one with Lou Ferrigno? No. No. I know what you're talking about. I, I guess Lou Ferrigno. Steve, would you incorrect? Steve, once again... WCW slash NWA had an 80s sitcom that featured many pro wrestling stars. Who was the star of the show? That's a good question there. I would have, uh, you know, I just know WWF had their, their shows. Uh, who had a sh Dusty Rhodes, for want of a better answer? No. Nope. Nikita, do you know? Hulk Hogan. <laughs> no, that is not correct. The answer was Lyle Alzado. Oh, wow. Wow. oh, my gosh. You're right. You're right. Good for him. Oh. We're well, number 10. <laughs> we're well, on time. So since you're on time, and I can't just give this question to Daryl. So the first one to buzz in for this one will be the winner. So anybody can answer this. Whoever says the answer first. What was the real name of Macho Man Randy Savage's Wrestling dad and brother. Angelo Papa and Lanny Papa. Yep. I think yeah. everybody got that. I can't tell you. Y'all all got that. Man. So we all, so you know what? Nobody has to give away their title as being the okay. top person. Oh, wait. I have a tiebreaker question. Uh oh. Let's do it. Now, what we're going to do is this the tiebreaker question. You're going to say your answer. But I will not say if it's right or wrong. So we're going to go Daryl, Steve, and Nikita. Okay. From there, after we get the answer, I'll let you know. I'll tell you this. The answer is a number. So if you go over, you're incorrect. The closest without going over. If everybody goes over, the person's closest on the other side, meaning that the answer was 100. You say 101. The other person says 102. 101 would win. And this is pretty easy. The tiebreaker question is, how many people were reported by WWF to have attended WrestleMania 3? Daryl, you go first. 93,800 even. I know that's not right. Okay, Steve? Uh, you know what? I know it's in the 90s. I'll go with 97,000. Okay, Nikita? 92,000. The answer and the champion of the very first whip show game show with his answer of 92,000 because the answer was 93,173. Okay, final goal to Nikita Bresnikov. Let's go, yeah. but wait a minute, wait a minute. I demand a recount. I'm calling my lawyer. Hold <laughs> on, <laughs> let's check it out. That's it. Oh man. <laughs> Well, guys, we're not going to get out of here yet because Daryl, he does have a question he likes to ask all yeah. our guests. And okay. Daryl, this is the perfect time to ask this. Yeah, yeah. You know, every time I ask, you know, you know, that what's the mark out moment? What's the moment in your life? You know, in some of the cases, the guys are wrestlers, right? You know, when you make it big and you're in your locker room and you and you run into this person, and it's kind of like a mark out moment for you. Was it for you guys? Like, was was a case where you met somebody, wrestled somebody, ran into somebody, say, "Oh my God, I can't believe I made it to be able to talk to this person." And keep in mind, that's inside. You might not have 
went crazy, run up and down the stairs. But inside, yeah. you're like, oh inside, my God. you're like, oh my God. For me, it was so many times to meet people like Chief J. Strongbo was my favorite, but to be in a match, Nikolai was wrestling Dominic Danucci and Bruno's the referee, and I'm there managing. It's like, I don't believe this. I cannot believe I'm here doing this. It's unbelievable. I just, you know, I. I was not crazy. I did not uh, stutter or fall down or anything. But Bruno hit me at the end, and it's like open hand, didn't try to kill me. And it's like, my God, he was no young guy. I'm thinking in his prime, he could have killed you. He probably, if he wanted to box, he would have been probably heavyweight champion too. So that for me, being in that match, it was just a wonderful moment. Steve? Okay, for me, well, probably being on my first call, Conference call for the script with Kevin Von Erich because he was my favorite Von Erich when I was, he was a high flyer and talking to him. And I mean, it was a real, but then you find out, you know, I'll tell you, you know what it was? Kevin, he took a lot of bumps in the ring, 35 concussions and kind of your hero worship gets a little tarnished because, you know, he'd forget certain things. His wife would jog him, but like in the middle of a conference, he would kind of, snap back to the old Kevin Von Erich, like when we talked about music. And uh, my late partner wanted to bring in a Christian rock band. She wanted all her friends to be in the movie. And Kevin said, no, nah, it's not the right song. You got to have a crescendo when the uh, wrestler comes down just the right moment. And he snapped back to the old Kevin Von Erich because he learned from Fritz. They had a great TV production. And I'm listening to him saying, that's the Kevin Von Erich I remember. And, and that was a great moment, you know, seeing that. And uh, hanging out with Steve Cox for 20 months in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, walking the streets of Tulsa with a former professional wrestler. And he was a larger than life character. We had a good time with that. And, uh, and getting yelled at by Chavo Guerrero on the phone before he figured out I was supposed to give him a call. <laughs> Those are Mark moments. Nice, nice. I got one last one. Just I got one last one definitely for these guys. We, it's, it's not often we're gonna get a case where we got people that, that know Vince McMahon Sr. and Vince McMahon Jr. Right. Yeah. What are your thoughts of senior? What are your thoughts of junior? You know, comparing the two and having me able to, to be, be in both spaces. I never met senior, but from what I've heard from so many and watched his product over the years, I think uh, junior's a chip off the old block, seriously. And I watched them on different, uh, like Madison Square Garden shows where the old man would come up and talk to junior. You know, it just seemed like they clicked. And when Vince talked about his father at his memorial, you could hear the emotion pour forth. He respected his father without a doubt. And I mean, he was third generation. It was Jess McMahon, then Vince McMahon Sr., then Vince Jr. So, hey, they, they just, that blood flows right on through. Yeah. And then you got Shane, fourth generation now. For me, uh I have a I have a problem. I mean, I respect everything Vince has done, but I just had a personal uh, kind of problem with him because he had the rights to the Von Erich story for about five years, and they lapsed in like 2010, and we came along in 2013. And, uh, you know, Vince, I mean, he would destroy a Von Erich story because, number one, he turned Kerry into the Texas tornado. He doesn't even acknowledge the name. But then he heard we were putting a, that I'd written a script, put a film together. Next thing I know, uh, the guy who created Highlander, writer Greg Wyden, he, uh, he, was, he was sent to meet with uh, Kevin Von Erich. And uh, Kevin hates Vince McMahon. He thinks Vince killed his brother, gave him just enough cocaine and hookers to keep him happy, and that was it, whether it's true or not. But when Greg, when Greg Wyden made his way to Kevin, I said, I remember seeing the second Highlander movie where they had wrestlers in it, the Freebirds, and I I realized that Greg Wyden was working for Vince McMahon's uh, studio, and he has a WWE studio in Los Angeles. And Kevin didn't want anything to do with Vince McMahon ever. So, and Vince was trying to like come at us, well, you know, we, we can offer you this and everything. And I said, Kevin, you know, the guy he sent you, Greg Wyden, good writer. Yeah, he's being sent by Vince McMahon. That was enough for Kevin to say, fuck that. I don't need, oops, I don't need that stuff at all. Uh, sorry about that. But yeah, so that was uh, my, so somehow Vince knows who I am in a, probably forgot who I am and I definitely know who he is, but yeah, he's kind of like the godfather of the business. You know, you can't really get much done. That's why I like AEW. Those guys, the Khan family, they've got money. They're taking them on. I think it's silly that NXT and AEW are on opposite each other, but neither one wants to blink, but yeah, I would like to see, 
Vince, relax. He's got more money than God, Vince. Uh, how much do you need at this point? Let some of the other wrestlers uh, do their business. Yeah. But uh, but I respect him as a businessman and what he's brought to the industry. I just, you know, I kind of keep my distance from him. That's all. <laughs> now, didn't Kevin work as an agent for like a second, you know, when they did the hall run that Hall of Fame time when they yeah, got him? I thought Kevin, he- Kevin and Michael Hayes, they were introducing on demand TV, some of the wrestling shows. Uh, so yeah, he worked for, he worked for Vince and uh, he also had the whole line of Von Eric toys, Mattel or whoever that, that they were doing action figures. But Kevin was always bitter that Kerry never saw a, a penny from the profits. None of the Von Erics did. So he figures, you know, Vince screwed him out of that money too. Uh, yeah, but yeah, he works for Vince. He doesn't have anything nice to say about Vince. And, uh, yeah, but he, uh, but look, Kevin's a legend in his own right. You know, he's just, he doesn't, the Von Erichs could have been big time in the WWE, by WWF, but turning Kerry into the Texas Tornado, giving him a push, push was over pretty quickly. And then it was the beginning of the end for Kerry. He was past his prime by that point. He was wrestling with half a foot. You know, he lost half his right foot in a motorcycle accident. But yeah, you know, it was kind of a sad ending. I would have liked to have seen the Von Erichs go big time earlier in their careers, but you know, it wasn't meant to be. That's actually crazy that, uh, that you talked about the foot thing for so yeah. many years. That was kayfabe. Like you know, obviously the guys knew, but they were able to work around that for so many years on TV, man. Well, you know, Kerry, they used to keep it. A, they used to keep it a secret. Uh, Kerry would shower with his boots on in the shower room, which any guy, you know, that's kind of weird too. But there's that one tape. Uh, it was it wasn't on television, but you can see it on YouTube sometimes. He was fight. Kerry was fighting in Las Vegas at the Showboat. Uh, Colonel Colonel uh, De Beers and Colonel De Beers pulled the prosthetic off by mistake, and the shock look on De Beers' face was unreal. Kerry grabbed the foot. Went under the ring. Nobody could see him. Reattached the foot. Got back in the ring. Uh, pinned Colonel De Beers. Was probably happy to get the hell out of there at that point. And uh, yeah, that was a surprise. A lot of people didn't know that he had a prosthetic. He was missing half the foot from motorcycle accident, and that got him hooked on painkillers, and then distributing painkillers, and you know, then suicide. There was a rumor I heard. I don't know if it was a shoot or not. They once said that Kurt Henning worked Kerry. He worked his foot, the prosthetic. You know, he's stopping the foot. But he purposely did that, but Kerry wasn't selling anything, and the fans didn't realize why he wasn't selling the fact that Kurt was working his ankle and his foot, man. And again, that could be just wrestling. That, that's yeah, probably the true. They had a nice run together, and then, right. uh, you know, and we then Kerry's was over. And we know Kurt was a river, so he was trying, he was liable to do that, man. Oh, uh, Kurt was the real deal. He learned from his his dad, Larry the Axe Hennig. Uh, he had a sad end, too, early, early death. You know, there's just too many of those stories. Well, guys, go, okay, go, go, I'm sorry. Go, 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 go. I'm sorry. I got one last one. I got one last one. I'm sorry. Because it came to mind. I know he always come to mind. And again, another case where we got a person that's kind of crossing layers. And this is my absolute last question. The Dynamite Kid. because And Nikita, I don't know if you know if you were there when he started to break in and had these great matches in Madison Square Garden. You know, obviously before the British Bulldog and all that. You know, what was it like? Was it, did the fans understand a person like that? I mean, obviously, way behind, way before his time. Yeah. I mean, even guys was, today aren't doing the stuff that he could do back then. Thoughts about the Dynamite Kid? And that's my last, last question. Well, now, see, that was November 22nd, 1982. He wrestled Tiger Mask in the garden. And you're right. People were like, wow, it yeah. was fantastic. But they did not have the lightweight division yet. But when you let them go and show what they can do, it was a fantastic match. Then, you know, years later, you had the Tonga kid when he came along. He was only 16, believe it or not, a lightweight, but he could fly around there. And then here he is in the main events with Piper and with Jimmy Snuka and Orton. And it was like, but Dynamite Kid, he gave a lot to the business. I'm good friends with uh, Bob Johnson and tied him with the Hart family and know those guys a lot, too. They loved Billington, without a doubt. Tommy Billington, Dynamite Kid. He was, you know, people say that, you know, they were good first. Well, sure. What the hell are you going to do after a while? You go stir crazy being on the road so long. But he could get it done. He yeah. was a fantastic athlete. And, yes, to tell you the truth, Daryl, people didn't know what to do. You know, it was before their time. At least I give WWE credit. They developed the lightweight division. 
That was smart, but they should have done it a long time ago, man. I just thought kid. you had to have the big beef guys, but you didn't. You got to have both. So a dynamite kid, one of my favorites, and like everybody, he was ahead of his time, a legit shooter also, but he really had his great success when they teamed him with the British Bulldog, you know, and which was a great tag team. I enjoyed that. But that was the only way the kid became real main, mainstream, put them together with a powerhouse British Bulldog. And they were great together, you know, and they're both gone too, man. You know, boy, every story ends with these people dead, man. It's sad, you know. Man. But it was a, they, he was a hell of a wrestler, Dynamite Kid. I just, I loved watching him in the ring before his time. Yeah. Well, guys, once again, I want to say thank you for being on the show. And we got to tell more stories. We got to bring you guys back for part two sometime. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. You know, and before, and once we get out of here, don't leave because we need to talk to you all for a second. So don't leave. Don't cut off just yet. Okay. But, Daryl, man, come on, man. Another great show, Daryl. I mean, we had history lessons right here. This oh, man. Thing, I can go with these guys for probably like two weeks. There's so much. Yeah. <laughs> we can have a two weeks. We're going to definitely get, get, get a part two in, man. Well, fans, y'all know what it is. Check us out each and every Friday. Wherever you listen to your podcast at Anchor, Spotify, just put in the Whip Show Podcast. YouTube, you can watch the video, the Whip Show Podcast. You got a guest you want on the show, email us, the Whip Show Podcast at gmail.com. We're on all social media platforms. But we're going to get out of here and we'll see y'all next time. I am Deshaun, Whip Dog Whipple, and Devastating Daryl Pace. And we had Nikita Brasnikoff and Steve Goldstein. And we will see you next time. Okay. okay. Pleasure, whoa, guys. Whoa, 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 whoa. I can't leave yet. I forgot something. Nikita, tell yes. us where to follow you at. Thank Steve, you. Thank tell you. Me where to follow you to buy your products. When it was real, it's about the 70s and the worldwide wrestling. Not me. It's about us, the fans. This book is full of passion. It's on crowbarpress.com and Amazon. Just, you know, I tell you what, everything we're talking about tonight, that's in here in, in the book. book. Yes, Steve. Right. No, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give us a link to that. We're going to put it up on our page as well, man. You got it. Okay, the great quote of our press with Scott Teal. He's got a hundred books, 200 books. Steve, what you got coming up, man? Well, still hope to get the Von Eric script made. I, I do have an animated uh script that I'm pushing with my attorney and uh, doing a few writing assignments, script evaluations for people and trying to uh move my own stuff i'm planning to get back to los angeles in the new year uh pandemic has kind of slowed everything down in hollywood right now but i've got projects i've got scripts and it'll end soon and get back to uh los angeles where i think i belong y'all heard that man and hey try to add them on facebook they might accept you they might not no they will they're great guys and they're great followers they always talk about wrestling if you're a hit wrestling historian you're gonna love to follow both of these guys on Facebook. Well, like I said, I'm Deshaun with Dog Whipple and Devastating Daryl Pace once again. And we will see you next time on the Wrestling Heroes and Insiders Podcast, aka The Whip Show. Take care, guys. Okay. Just for done. Now, guys, <laughs> thank you very much. Before we go, if y'all don't mind, can I get a, um, a quick drop from both of you guys? Just, hey, this is Nikita Brasnikov. Say the name of your book again. And I had a great time on the whip show. And Steve, do kind of the same thing, okay? Okay. All right, Daryl's going to um, get it all set. He's going to tell you one, two, three. And Nikita, you go first if that's okay. Yep. You know what? What I'm going to have you do, Nikita, is count yourself down so the camera's going to be at you. But you, so just say one, two, three, and just say, hey, I'm Nikita, and then go from there. I, I'm not going to worry about the book. I'm going to put your show over. Okay. That's good. All right. One, two, three. This is Nikita Brozhnikov. I was on the Whip Show, and I lived through it. So look, you'll have to watch it out, okay? The Whip Show, every Friday night. Be there, or else party can find you. Just for Daniel tomorrow. Okay. Now, Steve, same My thing. One, two, three. Hey. Hey, Steve Goldstein on the Whip Show. Had a great time. Screenwriter, wrestling fan, uh, working on the Von Erich story, and uh, hope to be back on the show with Daryl Pace and Deshaun Whipple. Had a great time, fellas. Perfect. Thank you guys very much. Like I said, that'll be up. I mean, it'll be up next Friday. And like I said, any links, anything you guys want me to put up as well, 
I'll definitely get that up, okay? Thank you. you got it, buddy. And we'll do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, definitely, we got we got a whole lot more we can go. I kind right, of like working good. with my old, old friend Nikita here. This is good. For sure, man. I like it, man. Take care, fellas. All right, guys. Thanks. Have a good night, guys. Okay.